I was getting so much last minute information on this gift. It was like very exciting. And so I, was, <laughs> I do not feel ready because I felt like I was like sticking in so many last minute details. Um, but it was super exciting because for the longest time, I didn't feel like I had a handle on this gift at all. And then I think with hello, what God was showing me last minute as he was bringing it all together in my mind. So I didn't understand it. I'm like, whoa, this is, this is incredible. <laughs> this is an incredible gift to understand and to know how to work with. But um, yeah, I am, I'm excited about today. I have a hunch it's gonna stir up emotion. I did not know there was a person close in my family that has, um, been a giver for a long time and I didn't know it until yesterday and it hit me and I just wept and wept and wept because I didn't realize the extent of um, how this gift was operating both her blessing and wounding uh, some deep wound because of the, some of the weaknesses of this gift and so I did not know how much this had impacted my life personally until yesterday when I started studying it and I was like holy spirit who do I know that's a giver and he told me and I'm like oh my goodness and I could see everything line up so it's sort of a really subtle gift and yet it's like so not subtle when you start to see the power brokers of the world that operate in this so mm -hmm. um I have a hunch it's going to bring up emotion, uh, some of it's strong, powerful emotion. And anytime there's uh, talk about money, there's uh, fear. Uh, and so there will also be some strong negative emotion probably that comes up. So I'm just going to start. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to start with a blessing um, over anybody carrying this gift before I go into my PowerPoint. So Lord, we just come before you and I, I just, first of all, take authority over any curses or any um, bitter root judgments or accusation or jealousy that have landed on people with the redemptive gift of giver. And we just take authority over those things. And we say that we as a people choose to release your blessings. We choose to release honor and we choose to release um, just a godly cleansing in any areas where you want to just pour out cleansing into the way this gift's been operating uh, in people in our lives and in people uh, that we come into encounter with. And I pray that you would show us um, where we have operated in this, where people around us have operated in this, and how to really uh, grow and mature and um, bless those that operate in this, but also be a blessing as we learn to grab hold of the godly gift of stewardship that these people really know how to model and exemplify when they're walking with you. So we just uh, release that blessing both on them and on us. And I pray that you would uh, guard our hearts and our spirits to release honor in a very profound, special way today in the name of Jesus. Yes. Can the <clears throat> gift of giver be the same redemptive gift or the love language? Hang on. Is the love language of gifts the same as the redemptive gift of giver? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Now, they can operate the same way, but absolutely not. So you can be a mercy or a servant and operate in the love language of of giver what well, your question was if is it the same so a person can operate in a love language of gifts like my daughter alaya she's a ruler but operates in a love language of gifts loves giving feels so loved when she's having something given to her um redemptive gift of giver you're going to see is very different than someone who just loves to give it's it's way more strategic than that and um so with that i'm going to just uh jump and um, can they be the same? Absolutely, they can be the same. Um, but don't like just say somebody who's generous is not the same as somebody who's redemptive gift of giver. Um, there's many, many generous people in the world. Prophets can be ridiculously generous, but they're not strategic the way a giver is. Um, redemptive gift of giving. 
There we go. I guess now I need to minimize you. Okay, so this basic conglomeration of the word of God that's been developed and tested by men like Bill Gothard, Arthur Burke, Rob Ruckert, Blue Ridge Vineyard Church, Mary Harrison. And I also found, I was using some from Stillwater's uh, Ministry, House of Healing, and this one is really fabulous, specifically on the redemptive gift of giver. I haven't read the other ones, but the Paraclete's Hammer has so much information on this gift. She has a blog on it. And if you want more information on this gift specifically, the Paraclete's Hammer goes into extensive detail that I couldn't put all in here. So, giver, uh, the principle of stewardship. So um, mm -hmm. some characteristics, and if I was to say there is any characteristic about this gift is this generational worldview. So they're focused on preparing the way for their family and others after him. Now you're gonna see exceptions to that because the weaknesses in this gift that can affect how, uh, how well they're at uh, obtaining their birthright. But um, when you think of a giver, they uh, want to create this long lasting effect. So there's this inheritance kind of effect. There's a, um, what am I passing on? What is my legacy? What's the legacy I'm passing on to other people? It's not always financial, but it can absolutely, it will always come out in blessing or cursing. So uh, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but the capacity of this gift to bless generations coming after them is incredible. So they're nurturing. They create a family environment to foster relationships. They're very independent. They stand alone. They don't look to other, pe for other people for help and sometimes not even God. Um, I got to admit, when I was first looking at this, I just thought, you know, a giver was a person that manages to get good deals. And so they're really great with money. And this is way deeper than that. It really is a way of being wired to think of, be, of being wired to um, not just think about money, think about how you use information, how you steward information. Um, you think of the power brokers in the world. Um, this gift is all over how the power brokers in the world are operating, whether for good or bad. Um, the people like Bill Gates, for instance, would be a name I'll just drop. Uh, probably a strong, strong redemptive gift of giver, not just because of his capacity to create wealth, but his capacity to pour it into things and really shift the power of where he's pouring money and information and knowledge into specific areas. So you can see the incredible impact of the world on the world for this gift really being leveraged as their power is being turned. They are really, um, Holy Spirit gave me the term gatekeepers <laughs> when I was studying this this morning. And you'll see with uh, Jacob when we get to him and the gates of heaven. So characteristics, they detect problems in themselves, uh, but not others. So that's a little bit different than the prophet where the prophet is very focused on what's going wrong, uh, specific inside of uh, themselves. Um, but also can just look across the room and see, okay, there's problems here, 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 and here. I will say, though, that the giver has a capacity to detect hidden agendas really fast and really doesn't like to be manipulated. Uh, they tend to be frugal with family members, which can cause friction. Now, even though they're like there to create this generational blessing, in a way, that's a huge part of how they're wired like their whole how they make all their decisions in their life is about creating long-term effects um they can they can be really frugal and so i i can think of different times this one person in my family was like okay i'm going to tell you this but i don't want to tell this person this because they will react a certain way and um or i will give you this inheritance but i won't give it to this family member even though they poorer than you because I see how you're going to treat it and I realize how they're going to treat it. So um, they, they are definitely like they, can, they control the shift of things in powerful ways, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. 
Uh, they desire to keep life private. Um, and a wife can be, that's a give, gift of giver. She can be really sensitive to if the husband is being manipulated. And I started to be aware of this um, in a big way in certain settings where you have maybe a mercy husband and you have a gift of giver wife. The wife will be like really cautioning the husband frequently, like careful how you're spending time over there. Uh, be careful what you're doing over there. These people might have this agenda for you. And so you see those kinds of warnings coming up all the time from the wife and a, a wise redemptive gift of giver, uh, especially woman has an incredible capacity for discernment. I think the men do too, but I know some of the people teaching this had really seen it standing out specifically in women. Um, Can you clarify uh, what's being manipulated? Husband's information. What information? <laughs> okay, so um, I'm trying to figure out how to say this without getting into too many private family stories because I could give you lots of examples. Okay, so for one example, my mother's redemptive gift of giver and really, really, really didn't like Facebook. Um, my, my father is, I've shared before, passed away of Parkinson's. And so information specific about his health, specific about what was going on uh, with fam family dynamics around that, around uh, different inheritances for other family members passing, all that information had a very, very tight grip on it about what was allowed to go out publicly and what wasn't. And, um, and there were, um, yeah, things put into place to guard that, I'll say. That's wisdom. Sometimes it's wisdom, sometimes it can be deeply manipulative. So you'll see in different areas in this gift where that can happen, yeah. Okay. She's wanting to safeguard anything about her husband. Yes. See, that's not clear in that statement, uh, but that's what you're saying. Yeah, and a lot of these statements are brief because it's such a deep gift. So I'm glad we can dive into them a little bit. But um, oh, if you say personal information, that would be much more clear. Sometimes it's personal information when this is a person leading an entire company or an entire foundation, uh, the amount of control that can be unleashed by allowing certain information to come out and not other information can be used really powerfully for good or evil. Sure. Um, so these people aren't just about controlling finances. Uh, information is power and it's a huge asset. This gift knows how to control <laughs> for good or for evil. Um, <laughs> So not confrontational by nature, uh, doesn't like to deal with old problems. So when I say not confrontational, they're not going to be in your face bringing up a problem. But what they do like to do is they will sit in a problem that is for their benefit. These people are masters of timing. You're going to see that they know how to get deals, etc. But they will sit in a problem that's creating high tension for everyone around them. And uh, it'll create high tension from everyone else. But for them, they're waiting for the exact moment to leap to get the incredible deal for the house sale or the incredible whatever it is. Um, but they don't like it when other people confront them and say, do you understand how this is impacting me? They don't like those confrontations. They're quite happy to let other people sort of stew while they wield the timing and the information and the finances to make it all happen uh, often with supernatural divine favor. Really, really powerful gift. Um, they have this diversity. So these people, um, it's really hard in a way of figuring out like who they are because they can get into everything. They're highly creative. So you're going to see them in any realm of career, um, in all sorts of different realms of career. They're really adaptable. They are flexible people. They just know how to leverage situations. If you were, they just really know how to leverage situations, but they get into everything. Um, it's really hard to sort of pinpoint them and say, oh, if they're an actor, they're this, or if they're a salesman, they're this. Really, you'll find these people in every walk of life and super, super creative, 
and being able to um, independently really build something up around them and then make it prosper. So they have a way more generalized characteristics than the other gifts, and yet this capacity to leverage things and steward things is uh, part of their wiring. Like it's not just a skill they've learned, it's actually they're, they're wired to have certain cautions, to have certain um, freedom in certain areas and an overall like confidence um, to be able to sway and leverage power in, in profound ways. Uh, so they resist being conned, manipulated, or guilt-tripped into action. Like I said, they can be in situations where everybody else is on pins and needles waiting for them to take action, and, um, and they're just going to hold off for the right moment. They, they resist any kind of manipulation or pressure. They are not pushed by pressure. Like, like a mercy or a servant, they would, uh, you know, they would be like, oh, what's everybody feeling about this and be swayed by that? This gift is not swayed by that. They're going to take action when it's the right time. Uh, tendency to feel manipulated when others withhold information from them. So because information is power and they get that, they innately know this, um, they don't like it when other people withhold information, although they're very typically withholding information from other people. <laughs> so that's an interesting um, part of this gift. They're able to relate to a wide range of people, natural networkers. So Mark has, uh, I guess it'd be like a second cousin high up in the business realm in this gift and uh, almost looks like an exhorter. They can relate to so many people, not network with so many people, and have this capacity to just really open up gates for other people to prosper, to flourish, to release blessings. They're a godly example of what this gift should look like and really creating legacy in family. Uh, they give well and wisely, not impulsively. You're gonna see people with this gift are less likely to um, see the beggar on the street with a sign saying, I need help. Uh, you know, give me money right now, they're less likely to fish out their wallet and give that person money as they are to drop, you know, a million dollars to Samaritan's purse, because they're going to check it out. Where has this money been stewarded properly? How can I create the biggest impact where this is actually going to create long term, even generational impact? These people are all about long term impact. They're thinking long term. What's what's going to impact the world? Um, they want to position their children and grandchildren after them for success. Um, I have a hunch, and I haven't studied this aspect a lot, but I have a hunch you see a lot of Asian nations walking in this. Also Israel, uh, you see walking as a nation in this gift, and we're going to see why Israel uh, when we study Jacob. Um, they have an immense heart for evangelism, but they're not often the fruit picker. So they will be pouring in uh, to things like Billy Graham Association, uh, pouring into the exhorters really with finances, with encouragement, with strategies for how to make that um, environment prosper. So characteristics. They tend, and this is supernatural, although if you ask the immature redemptive gift of giver, they would think it's just skill. They've picked up skills. <laughs> but, uh, and there is an, a wiring actually that enables them to pick up skills that other people couldn't, like their capacity to grab onto information that they need to wield it to pick up the skills necessary is also part of the gift of how this is designed. So they tend to find bargains, good deals, or discounts before making purchases. Um, not just because that's how they want to do it, but also because there's actually a divine supernatural favor on them to come across incredible deals. Uh, deals that other, you know, the rest of the world could only dream about these people find them and, and it works in their favor. Um, when the rest of the world's in recession, these people are thriving. Um, they may tend to see money as a source of security, so that would be a weakness. Uh, they can birth, nurture, and protect new things and new ideas. 
new things arise and grow at a greater pace than other gifts. So if you are doing a startup of a ministry, a startup of a business, a startup of whatever it is, your lemonade stand, uh, these people are people to have around, not just because they can find good bargains, not just because they're good with money or they're generous, but they literally have an anointing to um, see the red flags that need to be seen, to see what to invest in that's actually going to take off and prosper, to see where to hold back and who not to trust. Like there's so many things beyond just them pouring money into you that make this gift a blessing. This gift is such a blessing when they're, for instance, on a church board and they're operating with godly wisdom to see the entire church thrive, to be able to see those new buildings come forth, to be able to see those new programs prosper and flourish, um, because they just have that wisdom of how to steward things so that things can thrive, whereas other people, um, you know, might sell something right before it was about to, um, like, say, a stock. They might sell the stock right before it was about to explode. These people would just have that natural, almost like divine anointing to know to hold on to something and then to see it just take off and release incredible favor. If there is a God word for this gift, it would just be favor, favor for stewardship and prosperity and blessing, blessing other people. Um, so givers are opportunists. They will hunt and dig in on an issue, look for the prime, fine print, see the hidden opportunities that others miss, and engage in a great deal of data mining in order to work a situation to their advantage. And this is why I talk about this capacity to leverage situations is such a hallmark, but they leverage it for long-term generational benefit. Think of a person that locates the clauses in contracts and finds the ways that are legal around those clauses or leveraging those clauses to their advantage. They will find any available advantage and leverage it. And while this can be seen as negative, there can be a great good that can result in the life of a giver. And I would say those who are in partnership with them, who's devoted to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, if they put this quality to work for the kingdom of God, much can be accomplished. So you can think of how powerful this gift would be as a lawyer working to um, fight for religious freedoms. Like you can think of the incredible capacity this gift would have in so many areas when they're working for what God's calling them to work for. So um, knowledge is power, uh, strategic and subtle. Those are all strong words that could really um, point out this gift. And I'm just going to clarify, when I put a picture of the Rothschilds, I'm not saying that Every person in that family is a redemptive gift of giver. I'm saying that there's been actually somebody early on in that family, and they're a Jewish family, so we're going to get to that, but there is an anointing on that family of the redemptive gift of giver. So you will see certain redemptive gifts carry down family lines, carry down companies, and this is one of those generational gifts. You see that really strongly, and the Rothschilds are an example of that and um, like I said certain uh, names and parts of this will bring up emotion uh, the Rothschilds have received so much anti-semitic gar garbage <laughs> I'll put it that way uh, on their family name both because of um, conspiracy theories because of um, jealousy and and maybe at some level and I don't know God would know there may be some level of manipulation and control ha happening because that is a weakness of this redemptive gift. So um, we're going to see both the good and bad, the power to, to wield um, things through this gift is really incredible. Um, yeah, to the point, like, this gift can attract deep hatred. <laughs> I'll just say it that way. Uh, I'm not saying everybody who operates in this gift will attract it, but when you see it operated in huge um, ways, like the Rothschilds and other big power brokers of the world, there is this um, jealousy and hatred that comes at them. And so, which is why I released a blessing at the beginning, but the Rothschilds specifically, and I think it it's also because Satan hates the Jewish people. Um, but even, you know, one of the conspiracy theories literally said 
that they manipulated the entire Holocaust in order to create the state of Israel. And I'm like, that's a terrible thing <laughs> to blame a Jewish family for doing. Um, yeah, so some of the, the level of hatred coming against this gift, because it's so powerful, the enemy really uh, attacks big time. Um, and, Crystal? Yes. Can you just repeat what it was you said that this gift sometimes attracts something? Because your voice kind of went garbly there and I didn't hear what you said. Yeah, and I haven't heard anybody teach on this, but you can just see it by looking at the world, really. This gift can attract high levels of hatred and jealousy. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but their capacity to steward blessing and release generational blessing is incredible. Okay, so they, um, they'll resist giving startup money or giving directly to the poor. Uh, they prefer to give into tested strategic purposes. So even though they actually have this capacity to really nurture and bless startups, um, they will resist giving to startups. They, they want to strategically look at, if I put my money here, it's going to exponentially grow, you know, a hundred times. If I put my energy here, it's going to bless this whole institution. And so they are very strategic with all their assets, whether it's time, energy, money, information, uh, to really wield it to the capacity to grow. These gift, this gift has the capacity to make things grow. They're wired for growth. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's one of their huge anointings is wired for growth. So they're going to be careful how they invest all of their assets. Money is really just one of them. Um, they have a finesse to deal with or manipulate people. They can get a disproportionate return on the effort they put in, uh, except with God. There is times when you're going to see in scripture, um, people like Jacob really tried to finesse God and wheel and deal with God. And you can't work the same way with God. God is going to do what he wants. Sometimes he will choose to bless with no strings attached. And this gift sometimes can really struggle with that. They, um, in their weakness, they can keep a lot of strings attached. So, um, okay, they avoid bringing closure. So I'm like a prophet. They want to just sort of bring closure or leave a situation if it's too uncomfortable or there's too much immorality. This gift will sort of like hang in there because it's sort of like their lifeline, like what if at the last minute I could shift it? What if at the last minute I can leverage it? So they like keeping their situations wide open and it keeps a lot of people uncomfortable around them. And then at the last moment, they're gonna do what like makes them feel secure. Uh, these people love security in many, many ways. Um, so it brings them the most ease, but can create a lot of discomfort for people around them. And they're really not upset by that. They're like, well, if that person's upset, it's okay. At least I sort of have the best options open to me still. That's the way they think, which is so different from, say, a mercy, an exhorter, or uh, a servant gifting, uh, where we're all about, like, what's everybody thinking about this? How's this going to make them feel? They can maintain a lot of tension without bringing closure in order to steer their assets and opportunities to the best of their advantage. They are not in a rush, but they wait for the opportune moment, sometimes to the detriment of the more impulsive individuals around them. So, um, yeah, those of you who are impulsive, uh, this person could take advantage of you or could, um, yeah, get your gain that you sort of impulsively gave away. You think of Jacob and his father-in-law Laban and that whole interaction. Um, that's a good example of this with uh, how Jacob was able to gain, gain all this financial stability. And it was really detrimental in many ways to Laban, although there was blessing landed in Laban's life too while Jacob was working for him. So they have multiple projects and diverse interests in life. Uh, frequent inability to navel gaze, so they're not going to get stuck at thinking in their inner world. Um, becoming too obsessed with their own problems and their own existence or reason for being. 
givers do not usually self-obsess. Instead of looking inward, they look outward. As a result, they can be blind to how they really feel about an issue. So they're, they're not even really paying attention to their inner feelings, uh, let alone how it could impact other people's feelings. Uh, feelings really aren't a big determinant factor in how they wield things. <laughs> The giver capacity for subtlety is a frequent feature, a capacity to master whatever they are focused on. So these are very independent thinkers, and they they can just learn to get really um, high quality, excellent, really fast uh, and master it. They just have this ability. If I'm going to look at it and spend time in it, great, gain all the knowledge really fast and just master it, uh, get really good at it. They resist manipulation of information and hidden agendas. God created them this way, um, and really their capacity to protect the body of Christ in this way is really powerful um, if they're operating in righteousness. They are opportunistic in seizing the right moment, which helps them to delegate the warfare and avoid problems. Uh, these people don't deal with the same kind of warfare that a lot of people would deal with because they just have this innate ability to to control the timing. You think of a chess game. That's why I put it there. They know when to move the pieces in order to gain the most power over, in this case, their opponent. But it's about timing. It's about thinking five steps ahead. It's about having all the information necessary uh, to just make things happen in your favor. So uh, independence is something I've, I've mentioned already. They don't need others. A lot of gifts work well with other gifts. This is one that is uh, very able to work on their own and still really strategize and thrive. Um, and I think God does it because in his divine will, when this gift is operating the way he wants it to, um, they're not leaning like somebody else, like on like on a staff of, of another person in a sense. They really can just sort of move forward and get the job done and not be manipulated. When a person has the ability to gain incredible power and wealth, um, you don't want other people coming up under them and manipulating them. So they're not as likely to be manipulated, say, by a Jezebel or, or someone like that that wants the power. And, and they feel like that's a God thing. Um, they don't trust others to see their needs or look to them in healthy ways to meet their needs. They're very, um, I can do it. I can gain the skills. I can get what I need. And there's a self-confidence there. Uh, there can be hypocrisy. They may appear to do the right things, but not deeply pursue holiness. So this is a carnal giver, right? Uh, control and manipulation. They'd have this capacity to work in a, in a way that would really dominate people, especially because people can learn to rely on money. Let's think of um, a boss that puts out your paycheck. And if you don't operate the way they want you to, they can sort of shrink the paycheck or grow the paycheck. And so the capacity for manipulation could be exponential, right? Um, a carnal giver would desire to control based on fear of the unknown and risk or try to manipulate God. <laughs> um, they, they have this sense of innate ability to, to do it themselves. Um, they struggle to be grateful to others out of their sense and value for self-development or independent growth. So they have this sort of like self-made man feeling if they're carnal and um, the weakness would be they don't know how to depend on God. They're like, well, I can do it. I know how to do it. I know how to gain the skills. Um, I can see the road I need to get to where success is. And so I'm just going to do it in my own strength. So they have a hard time being grateful if they're carnal and um, they give credit to their own skills instead of recognizing, wait, there's actually a supernatural divine blessing on my life operating beyond what I am doing. Um, they would struggle to receive things from God, which they haven't earned. Um, they have this need to like perform and, and see their performance as the means of 
their blessing as opposed to recognizing wait there's an undercurrent of god blessing things and i'm just gonna jump um i'm gonna jump ahead just a tiny bit and i'm opening up here to genesis chapter 28 and talking about jacob jacob is redemptive gift of giver in the bible but um and you see how god's blessed the nation of israel in the capacity to make wealth in the capacity innovative in the capacity to even inform the entire world really on um how to on, on weapons on how to on self-defense like some of the amazing capacity they've got to see opportunities and release them um with this yeah innovation and information and finances uh you think of some of the diamond mines growing up my family had a friend that my parents i think they'd met in israel his name was israel i won't say his name because we're in a public thing but anyways um his first name was israel and he was an owner of uh some of the diamond mines in Israel, uh, Solomon's mines, which are still in operation in Israel, and the capacity to like create growth and just steward wealth was incredible. But I just want to go to, let's see if I can see it, uh, verse 14. This is God blessing Israel. And so you, we need to understand even the skill to make wealth comes from God. Um, so verse 14 of Genesis 28 God's blessing, Jacob, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You will spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south, and in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God really designed this capacity to carry blessing. It was a supernatural gift. It might feel like a natural skill, but it's actually a supernatural blessing given by God himself. Uh, right into Jacob, but you can see how it's designed to impact the entire world. It's designed to be an, a generational gift, not just for the people of Israel, but really to impact the entire world. And of course, the ultimate fulfillment of that we see in Jesus Christ, who of course was a Jewish man and steward all the power and glory of heaven and poured it out in order to bless all of mankind. That is really is the ultimate visible reality of this gift in its full fullness of his blessing you look at what christ did he had all the authority all the power all the wealth and he laid it all down in order to bless the entire world and to bring them into health and wholeness and blessing he became poor so we could become rich so i just had to stick that in early because yeah, this, so this ability to make wealth and everything, even the wiring for how to think is part of a supernatural blessing. So even though a carnal giver would want to take credit for it, it really comes from something given by God and it's not necessarily uh, something that they've worked for or strive for, although they will definitely put energy into this because it's their motivation. That's why these are also called motivational gifts. Um, they struggle to receive things from God, which they have earned, no strings attached, no conditions. They want to independently earn it and achieve it. So other things for a carnal giver, they have put trust and security in money or possessions. They don't see themselves as a, a conduit. So they not necessarily letting money or, or provision flow through them so they can become a hoarder. Think of Scrooge, right? um and uh put trust in extended family so carnal giver could walk out their faith more like a business contract god if i do this and if i put you know ten thousand into the offering plate i trust you're going to give me a hundred thousand <laughs> and so uh yeah can you get yeah um they want to keep their end of the bargain and hope God will keep his end of the bargain. So that could be in the carnal side. And you can see this operating in uh, different religious structures in a big way. Uh, it's not healthy. They use unhealthy emotional manipulation to control family members. Um, suspicious, fearful of what might happen, brings protective builds protective structures based on fear. And so they can uh, create this structure of like, if you do this, this, or this, 
then I'm going to withhold um, promotion from you, or I'm going to withhold money from you, or I'm going to withhold. Um, so people be can become very dependent on them, but then if they're carnal, they can become really controlling and manipulate lots of things, entire companies. Um, I have no I, no doubt that certain political schemes and when you, you know, that have been like really bad and when you really look into it, some of this stuff was operating, right? Somebody is leveraging the power of control and saying, you can't say this or I'm going to withhold this much money from you. Um, does not learn from the past well, makes the same mistakes over and over, but considers each situation unique and different. So is they can't see the patterns that they're reliving in their life. And that can be uh, really difficult. If they're carnal, they need to start recognizing patterns and so they can start living differently. Uh, they resent being confronted about pattern mistakes or things from the past. In fact, these people just don't like being confronted. They're quite happy to put other people into this discomfort while they leverage things, but they really um, don't like people sort of pushing an agenda on them. They want that leverage to be able to control their own agenda. Um, they give only in time of abundance. That's not what God created the giver for. God created them to uh, give when he says and where he says so that he can uh, provide the blessing, even in unforeseen miraculous ways. They can be overly cautious, decisions based on fear rather than on faith. And so they can't birth new things because they're like, well, I can only put money into this because it's proven and tested and true. So you can see how there's sort of an old wine skin mentality. And um, if they're carnal, they're not going to get that new wine skin uh, thing birthed and growing the way God designed them to. So uh, too frugal with family members or generous with an intent to control. So um, I've seen this a little bit where uh, it's sort of like, if if you come and do this for me or this for me, or I could use it this way in my life, then I'm going to open up this part of the inheritance to you. But this other poor person in the family, I'm not even going to tell them any of this is happening. Uh, independent to the extreme. So tries to live independent of God. This lack of relationship can cause the carnal giver to walk in fear and mistrust. And obviously a mature giver wouldn't walk independent of God. They would learn how to listen to him for cues and how to walk in faith. Um, they can have shallow connections with non-family members or sometimes family members too primarily because of that control of information and that desire to be independent so that I don't need to lean on anyone because that feels insecure. <laughs> um, doesn't accept God's absolutes and wants to keep their options open. And that's a huge facet of this gift. It's like, if my options are open, I can leverage the situation. Excuse me. Yes. Geraldina has lost connection. She's trying to get back in. Oh, okay. Let me just... Uh, the participants to see if she's in the waiting room yet okay i'm not seeing her in the waiting room yet so when she comes in usually it will pop up on my screen but if she's texting you oh there she is she just showed up perfect thanks for letting me know darling okay and like i say i can always cut that out of the video later so that's that's good to jump in and share that um, okay, so they can try to manipulate God and people. Um, desire to control based on fear of the unknown and risk. So these guys actually have a skill for managing risk. Um, you think of the stock exchange, right? But way more than that, a risk of if I tell this person this, will that limit my options? Um, if this person knows this, will that limit my options? So they're all of keeping the options way open and um, yeah. Can use their understanding of timing, generations and manipulation to release curses. So think of, uh, for those of you, especially in healing deliverance, you understand a little bit about Freemasonry and how it operates, where they um, will literally steal the power of future generations um, and in order to prop themselves up into uh, positions now, 
positions of government, positions of whatever is on the police force, uh, mayors, different things, and they will, in a sense, operate in witchcraft using curses against future generations to prop themselves up in power in the current generation. So if you think of that, that is the complete wicked distortion of how this gift could operate. Um, but think of how the generational curse operates that way and then flip it to what it would it look like if someone was operating in this gift as a blessing. And so you're releasing health into your family. You're releasing finances into your family. You're releasing opportunities into the, your family. And these guys can be this open door of releasing incredible amounts of blessing and promotion into their families. And um, we often think in this, of this gift just in the way of finances, but think of even like kingdom promotion, favor. Um, there's so much more than just finances operating in this gift and their capacity to leverage situations for blessing too. So here's some biblical examples, and this was sort of fun getting into it. So if you look at some of the examples Job gives of his own life of how he managed his finances, and he's like, God, I don't understand why this is happening, because look at what I was doing with what you'd given me. I was providing for the poor. Nobody would go hungry under my table. I made sure everybody was clothed and taken care of. And he was actually a very, very godly man in the way he was managing this. But he also had this heart to see his generations walk in purity. And so he was an intercessor for his family saying, I just, if my family's done anything wrong, I just break off anything they did because he wanted to see his generations blessed and um, the enemy afflicted him. But you see later God gave him back with way more than he had. Um, and this ability to carry generational blessing and favor um, really re-landed on his life after he went through that severe trial. Look at Abraham. Uh, Abraham and Jacob are, of course, father and son. And, um, you know, Abraham was offered by God protection. But he's like, but, but God, I don't have a child. Like, all my inheritance is going to have to get passed on to my servant. Is this the way you want it? Kind of thing. He's like, God, what I really want is generational blessing, something to be able to pass on to my children and my children's children and my children's children. And man has God answered that when you look at the, the Jewish nation in the world and the way God has said, I am choosing to lend blessings and favor and promotion and uh, this gift of stewardship, even stewarding information, think of technologies. I'm going to bless you with that on your people. And then we move over to Jacob. You look at Jacob, he was known first as the heel grabber, right? He, he struggled with this whole thing of control and manipulation, stealing inheritances from his brother by stealing that blessing. He saw the opportunities. <laughs> uh, he saw, wait a minute. I think I want this operating in my favor, and I want to take Esau's blessing from my father, and I want it for myself. And he really had to wrestle with all of that, um, the struggles and the weaknesses of the redemptive gift of giver. And then as he began to wrestle with God, literally, and realized he couldn't control the situation, and God uh, blessed him and blessed the people after him and decided you are going to release a blessing to the entire world. And of course, the fulfillment of that is in Christ. But there's so many other blessings of finances, of favor, of promotion, of, um, yeah, you can, you can see them. <laughs> and, and yes, it came with hardship too. You think of the Holocaust, there was some terrible hatred from the enemy release against God's people. And then in the Gospels, Matthew, uh, you read the book of Matthew, it has more on the topic of money than the other three Gospels combined. Now, I don't think it's just because he was a tax collector. I think he was actually wired by God to intuitively understand uh, not just money, but uh, so much in this realm of power 
and um, leveraging situations, but specific with him, he speaks a great deal on what Christ said about money and how to operate with money. So let's switch to mature giver. And I'm just gonna pop up the chat really quick to make sure I'm not missing something important. Yeah, there you go, Renee. Actually, the Rothschilds were instrumental in the funding and helping the resistance movements in Europe during the war. Yeah, that's great. Um, okay, mature giver, <clears throat> pardon me, trust God, sees themselves as a conduit of generational blessings that are life-giving far beyond Monday. So if that word conduit, they're a conduit, that's really key for this gift. Think of Abraham accruing and dispensing the generational blessings that we taste of even today. Um, you know, all of us Christians want to walk in those promises of Abraham through faith. And what's interesting about Abraham is he was like a father of the faith. This gift in the carnality would want to walk in this carnal knowledge, um, but God called him into friendship being a friend of God, and he learned how to uh, walk by faith, not just by his own skills and merit. And so the uh, ability for him to release blessings throughout the whole earth uh, was exponentially increased because of his walk with God. So they build, provide for future balanced generosity. They take financial risks based on faith, not just their own skill set or risk management. Uh, they stand against destructive forces of excess and indulgence. They use their anointing for strategic timing to bless ministries, businesses, boards, and families that they influence. Um, and the emphasis in that one would be the strategic timing, because again, I don't want you to see this as just a money based gift. This is about being wired for the timing of God to be able to leverage opportunity to bless other people. Um, they know how to walk in paths of righteousness for kingdom purposes. Uh, in the carnal side of this gift, they're not always focused on righteousness. They have other focuses. So the mature gift has chosen righteousness is a priority. I'm going to walk in righteousness. I know how to be a friend of God to possess their birthright, not walking only by their own expertise, but learning dependency on God. And they understand God, sorry, I should have capitalized that, wants their hearts, not just their sacrifice or gift or busyness. Um, and I, when Christ uh, was saying, you know, I desire obedience, not sacrifice, or I desire mercy, not sacrifice. He might be, you know, I don't want your millions of dollars. I want you to actually obey first, and that's going to bring the best blessing. Uh, I want your, your obedience, not just your finances, not just your uh, whatever it is you feel like you can give to the world. Mature giver gifts wisely to establish ministries in their time of abundance and in their time of need. So they will understand that uh, sometimes I only have this much available, but God's saying to give it, this must be a God opportunity and God is going to leverage it to bless other people. Uh, they trust God to deliver what he's promised. They're going to trust God and take financial risks based on faith instead of always waiting for the safe deal. Thus, they're able to access generational blessings that come by walking by faith. They have balanced generosity and take stand against the destructive forces of excess and indulgence. They are dependent on God. Now, this uh, gift isn't created to be highly dependent on other people, but God designed them to need to be dependent on him because there's a way higher level of blessing that can impact the nations when they are operating in dependence on God. Um, they trust God and see themselves as a conduit of blessing. They have learned that God, not finances and lack of threats, is security and comfort. So they've put their comfort in trusting God, not finances, not information, not just the ability to swing things in their favor. 
they have overcome fear through relationship with God. So here's some examples of some current richer gift of giver. And I'm not 100% sure on Chris Ballantin, but I see so many, um, so many patterns of how he walks in his church. And yes, he is office of a prophet in the church. You see him walking in office of a prophet, but his redemptive gift is uh, at least in part uh, the redemptive gift of giver. Uh, you see him just being very um, able to wield things in his favor and divine supernatural favor on finances and his ability to train up others in that and um, give powerfully to regions and to nations. And um, yeah, there's, so there's some incredible ability to leverage finances for the kingdom of God. So another one, I don't know if you know who this uh, dark fellow is here, Tony Ariomi. He is an incredible prophet, but part of his ministry, people working under him, he teaches them, this is how you operate in finances. This is how you trust God and what God is saying for move now for kingdom leverage. And um, if you have a problem with the word prosperity, I'm not talking about all the uh, effects of the prosperity gospel that's been used negatively. <laughs> But if you have a problem with the word prosperity, you're going to struggle and have to wrestle with this mature redemptive gift of giver because they are anointed to bring prosperity and blessing to the body of Christ. So you're going to have to wrestle through that. Like, what is it I don't like about money? And, and um, there can be a poverty mindset that lands on the church. Um, making it so that we actually don't learn the gifts of wisdom from the mature giver saying actually instead of just throwing all your money out at you know the addict <laughs> who's going to go spend on drugs how about we like carefully steward where we're going to pour this money into intentionally build finances so that these ministries can really impact regions and so they have a different way of thinking about money and we need to catch it it's powerful and i i just break off any uh curses that have landed specifically against any of these individuals um because of their strong stances on this is how we need to steward wealth and yet it can make people really uncomfortable because they're not about the easy way out the the comfort the immediate comfort um dave ramsey's known for like rice and beans thinking of you know you gotta get out of debt eat your rice and beans when you have to so you can prosper and lead generational blessings and be extravagant givers so my son loves dave ramsey he titus um has listened to dave ramsey for years and years and years and i was sharing with him this morning and oh, let's see if I can find He shared with me some things that Dave Ramsey himself does not advertise, but these are some ways that he loves giving and um, raising up many other people to be generous. But one of the things that he did was his company um, decided to buy up $1 million in consumer debt. And then he paid his employees to take time to phone all the individuals that owed that money and say, your debt has totally been forgiven. And so he paid his company to go into this. Um, another way that uh, he operated was he decided to um, sponsor all the expenses for a specific school uh, in his area. And then he paid his 11,000 employees to have the week off so they could go and volunteer for this uh, local school for a week. Um, and you want to work for people that have the redemptive gift of giver, that are operating in righteousness, because they are so good to their employees. You think of um, Chick-fil-A, people have been studying the way Chick-fil-A operates as a business because they are so good to set their employee ease up for success, for promotion, for healthy family life, for um, they're just thinking generationally way beyond the finances of how can we set up generational 
blessing. It's not all about manipulation and control. It's about like, we are wanting to release generational blessing on other people. We are wanting to just release incredible blessings into the world. So Pais was also sharing, Dave Ramsey has this radio broadcast studio with a visitor center. And in the visitor center, he has hired chefs to make fresh homemade cookies that are free all the time. So anybody who comes in can always just have access to fresh, brand new homemade cookies. Um, like hiring a chef to do that, like obviously it's not putting money in his pocket. It's just like, I just wanna create this space where people can come and settle in and learn about operating in financial blessing and so that they can be exponentially generous. And um, yeah, yeah. One year he intentionally gave away more than his annual salary. He just did it intentionally. This is something I'm gonna do. One year I'm just gonna make an annual salary and I'm and intentionally gonna be generous to give more than I made that year. Um, so this is just the way they think. They're not creating wealth out of greed. They're creating wealth out of like, how can I steward what God's given me and powerful release leverage in the kingdom of God and into people's lives to thrive. And so they love stewarding uh, the capacity to thrive. Okay, so I've just been rattling on and I haven't been reading this part. Wait, so let me just jump in. Um, so they develop life-giving relationships within immediate family. They know how to embrace the new wine. So what's the new thing God's doing? Let's pour into that um, so they can operate with God's wisdom by faith to know what to pour into. They develop life-giving relationships outside of their immediate family. They build and provide for the future based on faith. They walk in holiness, not casual about God's absolutes. So they're like, no, that is wrong. That would be a compromise. I'm not doing that. Um, they accept responsibility for past mistakes and they're willing to make amends and acknowledge unhealthy patterns in their lives. Uh, you think of Dave Ramsey, he teaches everybody by exposing all of his own mistakes, uh, but it's to release blessing in other people's lives. Their authority enables them to utilize their birthright to impart generational blessings of wealth and favor like Abraham. And they also have authority to guard new programs, ministries through intercession that in part, can impart blessings at the beginning of a project or ministry. So if you know someone that's redemptive gift of giver, and you can usually spot them because they're getting all the most amazing deals, um, for them to step in as an intercessor, uh, is really powerful. They can see ahead into the future. This needs to be cut off, or this is manipulative, or this, and they can just, as an intercessor, be really powerful to see things grow and develop and thrive. So it's really all about growth, developing growth. Um, and I just wanted to point this out. Chris Ballatin just recently did this podcast with uh, this beautiful lady here, Semia Pedalino. She is a Jewish lady, so she has this redemptive gift all over her family line, but also individually on her own life. And she just shares the story of how God raised her up as as an um, entrepreneur and shares about kingdom wealth and blessings. Now, you're going to see different strategies coming from someone like her than from Dave Ramsey. Uh, you know, she really buys into this scripture about you're going to be the lender and not the borrower. And so she's like, I don't see a problem uh, with debt. I just feel like God wants us to be the ones uh, in charge of it, not under it. <laughs> and so it's just a really interesting mindset. So this uh, link here, and uh, you can find the the broadcast that her and Chris Ballatin did, if you type in her name, Samia Pedalino, she just put out this book, Money Handbook, and just did a broadcast with Chris Ballatin, who also wrote a book on wealth. Um, incredible thinking through, okay, tithing, and how do I think about money to bless other people? And just a beautiful, beautiful mindset of stewarding God's riches, um, but even like wielding things, this this gift really is about wielding the strategies of God to release 
long-term generational blessings. But even really how not to think with a poverty spirit um, as a victim. This is not a victim mindset. If this gift is so not a victim mindset, it is this one. They are like feeling capable and powerful, and they know how to step into it with God uh, when they're operating in health. So the Jewish feast day for this gift is the Feast of Trumpets. I'm just going to see if I can shrink this down or move that up over here. Okay. It's, well, that's all the way now. Uh, the trumpets would blow at the end harvest. Uh, they have a few harvests throughout the year, but this was the fall harvest. It was the biggest harvest of the year right before Rosh Hashanah, which is the new year. And so um, there's this concept of long-term reaping. Um, this is the reminder of the eternal reaping beyond merely earthly generational assets. We're talking about God is going to come one day and he's going to bring in the harvest and what's going to last. What is going to last long term? And so this is this Jewish feast day is like a reminder because it's one of those sevens in scripture that lines up with this redemptive gift. And it's such a powerful reminder. Think from an eternal perspective. What's really going to last? What's really going to be uh, a treasure stored up in heaven, not just on earth? Uh, it really ties in with that desire that a mature redemptive gift of giver is going to have for evangelism. We're talking about long term heavenly riches stored up which would of course be like bringing your family bringing as many people to heaven with you as you can so it's storing up treasures in heaven not just the earth and to see the final harvest when that last trump sounds and the day of the lord comes and christ returns in the clouds um you know what what's happening what's happening is how is it going to you know, look when all the assets are counted up, what's going to burn up, what's going to count for eternity. What a beautiful reminder God put in with this Jewish feast day in alignment uh, with this redemptive gift. Think long term, not just generations financially or power wielding, but heavenly rewards, heavenly perspective, uh, the eternal perspective of heavenly assets and friendship with God will be measured and will God say, well done, good and faithful servant? Or will he say, I never knew you. This, this gift is really called into friendship with God. Okay, so here's a verse that is interesting. It popped up on Alea's uh, Bible app this morning. Um, we both use the version, but she was the one pointed out to me. This is the verse for today in version. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. So I thought, hmm, that's a God thing that that's popping up today. Think, um, think about how you're lending to the Lord. So here is the giver blessing. I'm just going to pause for a minute to get thoughts and feedback and, um, Let's see. There we go. <laughs> so feel free to unmute, put your camera on, and throw out all sorts of interesting ideas. Yes, I'm seeing uh, Rebecca, your comment, Bethel functions like that. Absolutely, they do. Bill Johnson really has this concept in his head too about um, giving and being a steward. Like, when the fires went through that whole region and the church has just said, okay, we're going to give a thousand dollars to anybody who's been impacted by this fire. Right? So you're right. Bethel has really learned how to be a conduit and impact government in their region through operating in this gift. Um, yeah, it's powerful. So go ahead, unmute. I went to a church once that um, gave 90% of their income to missions work and God just kept pouring money more and more and more into that church because they were giving away 90% of what came in and he just kept, kept giving them more money so that they could just keep giving more money away. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And really, even having the understanding when I work with someone who is redemptive, gift of giver, 
they can help birth things. Like even if I'm not expecting them to pour in finances, they're anointing to see things, uh, if they're mature, birthed and thriving and put mm -hmm. onto a solid foundation because of their capacity for intercession, uh, their capacity to see strategy, um, just really insightful, right? <laughs> I and mean, you guys are all chewing on the impact of this. You're like, this is profound. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Somebody would just put up a comment. Joala, yeah, Joala, why does Bethel Schools and Chris Valton courses so costly? Um, I think it would be because they know their worth. They know, um, now it's possible that if someone was created in India, uh, it might cost less. So it, they could probably produce things for uh, a cheaper cost. Cause I, I know in different countries, it costs less to create certain things. But um, I think part of it is they know the value and they also know if people um, don't understand the value of what they're getting. They're not going to put their time into it. They're not going to put their effort into it. So they also see uh, sometimes what people get for free, they don't value. And I have seen that at some level when we've given out, for instance, free healing and deliverance sessions. Um, sometimes the people won't take the time to actually apply what they've learned. Not in every case, but in some cases this is true where pe when people actually... Um, feel the need to actually pay for something, then they actually want to steward it properly in their own lives. So that might be part of their strategy, but I'm sure a person could dig into the thinking behind that way more than I could comment on right now in this, in this um, Zoom. Yeah. Go ahead, Renee. It's also just their time and their expertise, right? Yeah. It's like you're paying for a conference while the speaker is giving up time, expertise, knowledge, wisdom, and the workers worth their wages. So it's kind of a. Yeah, they're, they're admitting the value of like somebody had to learn this, somebody had to produce this, somebody like it costs them, it costs to put out information. And I think for me as a mercy, many times I've put things out and uh, been taken advantage of and, and really not being able to see the fruit in some people's lives because I haven't understood some of these principles. And so uh, these people understand um, impact. They understand how to create impact. And uh, sometimes people that are struggling don't like it because they can feel that tension of, I don't know how to access stuff. Um, and I'm not talking, of course, about Bethel in, General Antonio Givers more broadly. So, okay, thank you. Like, actually, it did not come from the thought that in India they are cheap. Actually, in India, we don't have any such courses or schools. Okay, but I think like <clears throat> one. I mean, there are a few times when I tried to check and I'm interested. I would not effort. <laughs> so I was like, oh my god, this is so costly. Yeah. Um, there are times I paid for some courses or books, even in US or Canada, but uh, I felt they are a little bit reasonable, like even average Indians or some people outside US can somehow afford, but uh, specific uh, names, as I mentioned, they are like two way that it's too hard to, I mean, when we convert Indian money, right, it's very, very costly for us. So I thought that maybe if it is costly for me, it would probably costly for average American also because not every American is nearly earning, right? So that way, is it not like inhibiting the more people that could probably take the course or something like that? And really, if... If Bethel Church does, let's say they do operate highly in this redemptive gift, let's say this is a non on Bethel Church, which I wouldn't be surprised it is, um, they're thinking about larger impact. So um, they're thinking, okay, we need to get this into the hands of leaders who are going to also produce it. So the leaders that are going to have the money mm -hmm. to buy it are the people that are going to be able to release it to greater volumes of people as opposed to maybe the one poor person getting this. So it, it might, it, it's part of those strategic ways 
and I can't speak to why Bethel's motivations are really. Right. It's not about just Bethel, but why I brought Bethel, because if we see that, okay, Bethel or Chris Wallet and these people are really operating in that, there are so much givers. Yeah. Then why they have to take so much also is some average person like me will think. As in, okay, because they're, if there's if somebody here is taking so much and they look like they are giving so much from where they are giving, they are taking from these people and they are giving somewhere else, a yeah. little bit of that and they are earning even more than what they are giving. So people and, like me cannot see it like uh, really that they are having mercy or giving like that, right? They would generally, there is more high chance that we would see it as something not really good also. I mean, as in, I could be wrong. I mean, I'm not saying I'm right. The general perspective, what people can think, they'll get all these doubts. Like if they're so right. generous, why do put up that much cost first? Because you are saying about leaders. Not every leader can afford that also, right? Still, there are small church leaders. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm just commenting on the way this gift operates in general. So there's going to be other people in the body of Christ that aren't um, thinking so strategically. But remember that this gift also operates in how they let out information. So they are not going to probably advertise how they gave a million dollars over to sponsor a school getting all this information for education. They're not gonna advertise all the other ways they've been generous. So this is why they can bring on uh, jealousy or judgment in the body of Christ because the body can't see what's going on behind the scenes. And so sometimes we can judge only according to what we see and we don't see the exponential impact that's way bigger than what we're just currently seeing. We're just seeing how it's impacting us specifically, but we actually aren't seeing the behind the scenes impact of what's really going on because uh, this is not broadly advertised here. I'm giving, <laughs> right? That's not the way this gift operates. They're way more strategic and private than that and and God designed that so um yeah I would I would say hold off when you're seeing especially redemptive gift of giver how um the withholding might be impacting you negatively just remember there's a high high chance somewhere else there's a lavish generosity that we're just not seeing and we're mm -hmm. not picking up on so we have to be very, very careful not to uh, release judgments. Yeah. Oh, it probably depends on the individual, but it's a really fabulous con uh, question. I think sometimes there's, there, there will be, uh, it, we'll, we'll talk about the carnal first. There would be this um, d disdain. Like, I can't believe they didn't see that. I can't believe they're being so wasteful. I can't believe they missed that amazing opportunity. And they'd be sort of like shaking their heads because they sort of assume the rest of the world can see the way they can see. But really, it's a God wiring where they actually have a supernatural ability to see things and, and do the research even to be able to see the opportunity. So sometimes they would just like shake their head and be like, I can't believe they're still stuck there in poverty when all these opportunities came their way and they didn't know how to grab them for what they were, which is, I think, why uh, there is not always that generosity to the poor spur of the moment because they're like, I can't believe they're still stuck there. There's so many ways they could get out of poverty. This is just how they think because they're like, well, I can see all the ways I could get out of poverty if I was in their shoes. Um, so that would be the carnal giver. Um, obviously, if they are in tune with God, they're going to think the way God's thinking about situations as God's giving them extra revelation and information about what's really going on behind the scenes, maybe how a curse has been operating. And so no matter how hard this person tries, they're spinning their wheels. And there is a curse specific to redemptive gift of giver that actually will bring seasonal loss. And so if you know someone that every like say every year at a certain time of year, there's this incredible like thieving and robbing going on in their life. Um, that is, is probably because this, this redemptive gift um, was manipulated by the enemy to work in all the wrong ways. And it opened up a door for the enemy to come steal from them seasonally. And um, if you're aware of that, I may be able to find the website that I was finding. There's actually renunciations to break off some of these curses 
Um, but you will see that the enemy can powerfully steal from these people too, if uh, they've opened the door for that in their generational line even. So it could be affecting you, right? It's a generational thing. So you may be experiencing some of the effects of a generational curse if a giver in your family operated in carnality in a big way, opening up the door for curses in your family. So. Thank you. I have to go. I have to go pick up my little one. But bye bye. That was fascinating. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Boom. Any other any other questions or thoughts before I go on to the blessing? Go ahead, David. Uh, I don't want to take this to go off too far with this, but you raised Bill Gates at the beginning, and uh, I have a very negative opinion of him. Um, and it really colored my re re intake of all of the carnal uh, descriptions you gave of this gift. And I felt, I was thinking, thank God I don't have anybody in my life with this gift. It was one of my thoughts. Um, I read you that- You probably do, you just haven't recognized them because if they're not yeah, operating yeah, sure. at that level, it's uh, way more subtle. But Bill Gates has a cover story that he started Microsoft in a garage with little bits of money from his family. And actually that story was said to be baloney. And it's uh, my belief that he's part of the deep state. Um, he gives large amounts of money to the WHO, which is bent on heading towards one world government. Uh, Ted Ross is a puppet, the head of the WHO. And, uh, was a part of the pandemic to make this whole thing uh, oppressive on the world. So he has a very bad um, place in the world right now with all that he's done with what he has done and who he is. So uh, it, it really made me think that it's not a great gift in the world because the, those who are carnal with this gift are doing so much damage, more probably <laughs> that I'm aware of, than those who are uh, using it in a godly way. Um, well, and that's what you can see. Like I said, these people are really cautious about how much information leaks out. And also, uh, the capacity for people to create uh, and then conspiracy theories to way blow out of proportion what's happening on is also there. So I'm not saying, I'm not going to say comment too much specific on Bill Gates, but for sure, you can see how he's leveraging uh, the power that he's been given with both information and knowledge and finances and how it's impacting the world. You can see that to a large extent. And so, but I would say with the godly examples of a redemptive gift of Gipper, um, I would say probably some of the most powerful ones we don't even know about because they're very, very private. Yes. So we yes. cannot see the capacity of what they're leveraging in the world. You think yes, of a um, oh, Holy Spirit just brought someone else to mind. Troy Brewer. Uh, Troy Brewer has this yeah. incredible capacity to create wealth, even within like offerings for courses. And what does he do with it? He uses it to buy children out of sex slavery. And so like, there's so much that actually happens with this gift that we don't know. So I'm not going to um, say, God, you made oh, a man. mistake. Yeah. <laughs> but absolutely, it's interesting. people can use their power for witchcraft, for evil, or they can use it for God's kingdom. And obviously that's their choice. I heard Troy Brewer's testimony last week, and he's been in ministry for well over 20 years. And he's been doing this for well over 20 years. And he started with a little church of less than 100 people. Yeah. And they feed thousands every month. Yeah. And they bring out thousands of children out of sex slavery. Yeah. Um, and this is all... He, he said, my church hasn't grown. He said, my church is not that big. But God just keeps prospering him. Yeah. God keeps providing for him. Yeah. And when they're operating in their godly calling, God will just funnel yeah. so many finances through them because it's really mm -hmm. impact way bigger than they are. So the amount of lives impacted and in heaven really this can only be measured from an eternal perspective who ends up in heaven uh you know because of this gift it's going to be incredible it's going to be incredible mm -hmm. yeah that's a little prayer that i got um 
that the Lord would prosper those who um, have used their money for the kingdom purposes. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. That he would prosper them. Okay, I'm going to jump into the blessing um, because I want to sort of stay on time. I know we always go a little bit later than I want, but I want to just take the moment to jump into the, the blessing. Okay, and feel free to just mute so we don't get any extra background noises. All right, giver, God chose you in Christ before the creation of the world to be who you are and to be gifted just as you are. You are not as out front as some of the other gifts, but they need you. I bless you to be enriched and enlarged in God's design of you and to come into alignment with his plans for you. God loves your gift. He celebrates the complexity of your life. I bless you for your diversity. You're involved in many projects, interests, and activities. You are adaptable and flexible. You do not fit easily into stereotypes or molds. I bless your nurturing and celebrating family and your desire to have family comfortable in relationship. Nurture is a big component of your gift. It is an expression of the nature of God. I bless you as you release into your family line everything that God has in the gold mine of your inheritance. I bless you with representing the heart of the Father who is a God of community. You represent his desire to create, nurture, and sustain community because you're made in his image. You are life-giving. I bless your desire, ability, and authority to birth nurture and protect new ideas, new ministries, and new things. The prophet gift needs you for the synergy released when you and the prophet team together in alignment and timing that God has designed for the two of you. I bless your generational worldview. You are focused on preparing the way for others after you. God designed you to release generational blessings. God calls you to bless and to raise blessing to a high level. You fulfill your birthright when you invoke life-giving generational blessings for your family and community and produce life-giving systems that express God's design. I bless you for your independence and how you stand alone. It is a positive trait when it partners with acknowledging your need of God, pride and personal competence is a challenging occupational hazard for the giver gift. I bless you with the ability to overcome the temptation of considering yourself to be self-contained, having the authority, the money, the influence, the resources, and or security to do whatever you feel led to do. I bless you to be vigilant and not to let this strength be corrupted into control, which is a perversion of your gift. I bless you with understanding and an awareness of where your gift gets tripped up. I bless you with healing of the wounds that have caused your basic trust to be fractured and cause you to respond out of woundedness. I bless you to grow into your greatest potential, living in the authority and honor of the giver gift. I bless you, giver, to win the battle of gratitude. I bless you as a networker, bringing people together, persuading and inspiring people to do things that they would not normally do. You speak of what is good, righteous, and commendable in other people. You resist manipulation of information. You do not like to have anything withheld from you. You have an intuitive sense for what is false. I bless your gift of discernment in this area. I bless you to go deeper with God and deepen your spiritual motivation of holiness, which is pleasing to him. You find favor in money and resources flowing to you without human explanation or reason. It just comes. You find bargains and discounts. 
At times you may find yourself fighting the temptation to use money as a point of security or as a means of gratification, entitlement, reward, or control. I bless your spirit with the ability to overcome these temptations. I bless you to give well and wisely where there is the greatest potential for eternal return on your investment. When your giving is exercised with God's wisdom, it makes others grateful and he gets the glory. I bless you, giver, with being secure because of your relationship with God. Let God take your faith to new levels. Sometimes faith, faith is hard for you because you want to avoid risk and it may lead to fear and control. It is not God's design for you to play it safe and only do things that you are sure you can handle. I bless you with faith that is greater than fear of risk. I bless you with being the model of a steward of everything God gives. The community needs the dignity, honor, and beauty of the God-seeking giver. I bless you with moving into your full birthright. In Jesus' name, amen. And, oh, just a minute, I realized somehow I skipped a slide, so give me one second. I just want to make sure, I hopefully it, there it is. Did we do, we did, do did we do this right. slide, the, the battlefield, etc.? Okay, let's go back here, because I don't want to miss this. So the main battlefield of the redemptive gift of giver would be they want to stand alone and independent of others here let me just uh here jump into this properly there we go the legitimacy line for them would be i'm legitimate when others need me so i can provide for them uh, the verse right of the giver is to release life-giving generational blessings and uh Creation day five is the, on the list of sevens that ties in with this. So you think of when God called the uh, for multiplication. It was the first day he released a blessing for multiplication. Um, you know, the creatures of the sea, the birds of, and the fish. And um, it was about reproducing and multiplying. The tabernacle item for this would be the altar of incense. So you think of that fragrance in worship and intercession flowing out way beyond um, where you first place it, right? The smell just permeates everything. And um, you think of, it's all tied in with gratitude and worship and coming into God's presence in this place of gratitude. So, and in the name of God, and Psalm 23 is really key for this particular gift and managing risk and all of that, but um, the Lord is my shepherd. He's the one that gives provision. He's the one that gives safety. He's the one that leads you into quiet waters. It's about him. It's not all about you managing risks. I'm going to um, just let someone close us in prayer, and then we can chat after that, and I'll pause the recording after that. So, Rebecca, would you be willing to just close this time in prayer and um I could tell you're chewing deeply, but I have a hunch you have a profound sense of what could be prayed really powerfully over this time and gift. So uh, would you be willing to, to pray just closing off this time? Definitely. Lord, we just thank you for um, this, this classes that we've been taking and, and how you're revealing your truths to who we are and who we are in you and the gifts that you have on each of our lives. And I pray, Lord, that you would just, um, that we would just walk in your authority and your power and going out and um, as we orchestrate these gifts and maybe we um, wise in as we walk rather than carnal and we just thank you and praise you for what you're doing in and through each one. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, yeah, yeah, thank you.